I'm sitting here with Alan O'Duffy. We're just going to have a chat. Let's just talk about some of the artists that you worked with over the years. Let's just reel them off. What was it like to be sat behind a desk? If I said to you, pick out one moment, a moment in time where you think, my God, I'm actually doing this, what would those moments be? Well, I'll start from the beginning, if I may, and that is the first week I worked in a recording studio. I was going to go diving on the Thursday night because I wanted to become a sub-aqua swimmer diver. The man who ran the studio is called Robert Auger, Bob Auger, and he said, can you work overtime? And I said, well, actually, I'm going to do a sub-aqua class. And he said, oh, we need you, you know, to do this thing for Marlena Dietrich. And I thought, I didn't really quite know who she was, but anyway, I did tape operating on my first Thursday working and I was 17 and the following week a band arrived in a Bedford van from Birmingham and they came down with sandwiches made by their mum and the band just had a hit record which was called Keep On Running and the lead singer was my age exactly Stevie Winwood and we made a record with them which was the first Spencer Davis album I had a wonderful time because uh, Stevie Winwood asked me what would be all right if he played piano when we went out for lunch. And he stayed behind and had sandwiches made by his mum playing the piano. Steve, when, you, when you drop a name like Steve Winwood in a conversation, Steve Winwood, I mean, you know, again, an artist mm. who's, who's one of a kind in this country with regards to the way that he sings, the soul, the, you know, the, actual, the actual depth of his voice. And, and how, old, how old must you have been when you, when you met him and worked well, with him? Well, we're both the same age. Stevie Winwood was 17 years old when he came into the studio with the sandwiches made by his mum down the M1 and he sat on the back on top of the drum kit boxes. His song just that day was... Somebody help me, yeah, do do do. Somebody help me now. Won't somebody tell me what I've done wrong? So I had to, had to sing it because I couldn't remember the title. So Somebody Help Me was the follow up to Keep On Running. And uh, I was 17 and so was he. Pi Studio 2, the engineer was Bob Auger. What was it in your life that made you first want to do this? What, what was the, the foundation of, of your interest and love of music? Before I was born, my dad was a radio star in England and Ireland, cutting records at Abbey Road Studios as a solo artist with a small symphony orchestra. When I was a kid, we used to have the test pressing, or the white label as it was called, and around the record player, which was a rarity those days, my mum and dad would be talking about sibilance, balance, diction, arrangements and all that stuff. So that was part of my childhood, was this business of music. And we had a harmonium and a piano in the front room. So music was right there, right at the beginning. When was the first time that you actually felt charged by music? I'd imagine it would have been in a choir or something. Every time the school had a, um, a show or a, a concert or whatever, I was always the lead singer, funny that. Uh, because I could sing, that's one of the tall bloke who could sing. And I remember once upon a time my dad made a record called I'll Take You Home Again, Kathleen. We had uh, the, the normal thing in primary school where the question was, well, anybody got any news? And some boys talked about, oh, you know, we were down the beach and we made a big sandcastle. And my news was my dad made a record, you see. <laughs> and I said to the, uh, the teacher, oh, my dad made a record. And they said, oh, right, how does it go? So... I sang, I'll take you home again, Kathleen, to where your heart will feel no pain. And it's a Canadian song about crossing Lake Superior, and it, but it was adopted by the Irish Americans as a song about Ireland, which it in fact wasn't. But anyway, I sang it, and the tea, it was a hot day, and the teacher opened the door of the classroom and there was a, it was a new-ish building and there was a long corridor with uh, lino on the floor so that my voice echoed around the school and the boys afterwards were saying, oh, we heard you, Duffy, we heard you singing, you know. That was quite fun, really. But I always was interested in music and singing, particularly. From a point of view, then, of, of, of how you came away from behind the microphone and ended up behind a desk, talk to me about those early days when, uh, when, when you first started in the studios then? My cousin Jared McHugh, a fellow in Dublin, had a shop called 
McHugh himself and it was a, a, like a general store but upstairs they sold record players. My cousin had arrived in our house in Dublin which overlooked a beach and he arrived with the tape machine and recorded my dad and I was and I was six or seven or something when he arrived and I was it was a big deal it was a Telefunken tape machine reel to reel machine so that fascinated me and he had the technology and he had all the latest uh, hi-fi gear at the time which was mono and so Jared used to entertain me and educate me about music and Ray Conniff and Andre Previn and uh, Robert Farnan where uh, music and sounds in my life through my cousin Jared and, and his family. So I wasn't a fantastically academic fellow and I ended up out on my ear having left grammar school, not doing A-levels and I was sort of unemployed but my dad had made a record at Pi Studios with um, Ray Prickett and Bob Auger uh, who were the engineers uh, and, the, and the arranger was uh, Bill Shepard and then another album he made was with an arranger called Tony Hatch. So Dad had dragged me along to the studio when I was a kid and we had to dress up in our Sunday best with ties on and all this. And I had seen Ray Prickett uh, particularly explain to me what they were doing in the studio. And we were then heroes in school because we knew what happened in a recording studio. Ha ha. And how they put the echo on the backing vocals. So um, at the age of 17, I wrote to Bob Auger and said... Um, I'm madly keen on, on music and I fiddle around with tape machines, which is all true. And I got a competitive interview where there was several people who wanted to work at Pi Studios. And for some reason, I got in the door. It was a very mechanical process, though, wasn't it, in, in, at the time? It wasn't, if, if you try and use a modern context to describe what it was that you were doing, whereas everything's digital and, 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 and this was physical, wasn't it? It was almost like cut and splice. Well, it was precisely that. It was analog. The, the first sessions that I was involved with were mono to mono. So, for example, on week three in my studio life, uh, we had a band from Muswell Hill, and they were called the Kinks. And the recording session process was recording the backing track on one tape machine. OK, thank you very much. You then take the tape off and put it on machine two. Then you play back the backing track, which is the band playing away, and you play back the sound of the band through a Lockwood speaker, and the band stand in front of the Lockwood speaker with a microphone and maybe two microphones, and you would then record the lead vocal and the, and the solo, or the guitar solo, and then you'd put those two together into mono, and that was it, folks. Good night, let's go and have lunch. We've cut three tracks already, and there was no question of a mix or anything else. And it was the skill of a man called Alan McKenzie, who and I was the assistant, who translated what Shell Tamley, who was the producer on that, he translated that into hit records. And I, uh, you know, when, within the years of that time, I was working on Waterloo Sunset, dedicated follower of fashion, Autumn Almanac, Dead End Street, and I sang backing vocals on that. And all of that plethora of fantastic songs written by Ray Davis, I was the assistant on that stuff. And what a legacy, and it still sounds marvellous today. When you think about the subtlety, the depth, the actual, um, the, the, just the general sound that, that that represented. When you think about that mono track, it was so simple, and yet, the, can you compare it to what you, what you hear today? Was there a depth to it? Was there was there a subtlety to it? Compare and contrast the two ways of doing it. Um, I have a lovely friend in Wales who's a, a, a boffin and a professor. He asked me, how did we get that guitar sound? And I said, well, both guitarists, they were in the room together. So Ray and Dave were both playing guitar. You don't mean to say that they both played at the same time. And I said, yeah, they did. And there was an interaction, at which there is, both in a sort of sensory sit situation where both guys can see what each other's are doing. But equally, there was a um, intrinsic uh, psychological connection where they're both listening to each other and vibing off each other. So it was called musicianship and interaction and vibing and feel and soul and that's what it was and that is something that I love and it was also without click tracks so when the drummer was drumming he was driving the, the show and it was rocking as it, as it should and if you listen to Tired of Waiting or if you listen to um, da -na 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 -na, da -na 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 -na, Girl 
you really got me going. You just think it actually, it actually rocks. It really does. And the, I wasn't in, on that track particularly, but what, what a legacy and what a, it still stands beautiful today in Liverpool. I mean, you, amongst anybody that I know, have worked with some incredible artists. I mean, you know, like you've got, you know, you work with, with, with people that are quite rightly probably regarded nowadays as legends. I mean, give me some sense of, of, of some of the artists that you work with. Mark, do you want a list? <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, just just hit me with some some of the names of the people that stand out in in a, in a very long list. Okay, I would have to put Paul McCartney up at the top, a man from Liverpool who who I love, and he was a wonderful, humble, and family man, and a guy with his feet on the ground, and a, a, a very proud to have ever known him and worked with him and sang harmony with him too. And then there would be Eric Clapton who was a, a quiet guy. When I knew him, he was going through whatever he was going through, but he played beautifully. I've also, I'm have also i still in touch with his friend, Andy fairweather Lou, who ran Amen Corner. And when I was 19, I had a number one hit record in England called If Paradise Is Half As Nice. So that was the beginning of my formality in terms of mixing because I, I was an assistant and, and watching other people make records like the Rolling Stones when I was uh, 17, 18 and then when I was 18 and a half. Andrew Oldham who ran uh, the Rolling Stones band who promoted them in the first place uh, and he was their manager and he said to the people who ran Olympic who's a guy called Keith Grant he said um, if you employ Irish was my nickname and my name is Alan O'Duffy but if you employ Irish, I'll bring all my work to Olympic Studios, which he did, and I got the job. Funny that. Incredible. If you look back at the decades, let's just go back to the 60s. I mean, some of the, some of the names that, that, you know, that, that are on, on a list. What I'm trying to find out really is, is your involvement in the industry at that time throughout those decades really reflected some of the, the biggest names that were in the recording industry at the time, didn't it? I think I was in the right place at the right time, curiously. And the first time I was uh, offered to actually mix something of my own, do a recording, was with Steve Marriott. And I had known him from Sha La 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 Lee, St uh, The Small Faces. And I knew he was great and all that stuff, but I didn't know who he was really. And he walks in the door and he produced a track with a man called Billy Nichols, who went on to be a friend of The Who and uh, Pete Townsend and Billy are best mates. But uh, we made a track called Would You Believe where uh, Steve Marriott produced it. And what a, what a wonderful time we had. And the track was called Would You Believe. So that was, that was page one for me going in the door of um, being a recording engineer. But as a result of that being so successful, I then got to record a band called The Nice. But of particular interest was the keyboard player who had worked in a bank and his dad had put a deposit on a higher purchase of, of an organ and uh, Keith Emerson was a concert pianist which is a different thing from a, 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 a guitarist who plays piano because he has to like with respect to Paul McCartney Paul McCartney's a guitar player or bass player who plays piano as well but Keith was a concert pianist and he had a, a catalogue in his head of classical music so he brought his classical music and his skill set into playing organ and I made one side of the first Nice album with Keith Emerson. What a fantastic, influential and marvellous man that I had met then who went on to become Emerson Lake and Palmer, Keith Emerson who, who passed away sadly but I had the greatest of time for him. One of the, one of the most um, memorable things that I know that you, you were involved in was the uh, the work that went into recording Jesus Christ Superstar. Oh, yeah. And um, from, from my point of view, what, what was that like? I mean, I, I can imagine, although you're looking at it now, 50 years have passed since you recorded that. At the time, what did you think it was gonna be? Did you think it was gonna be anywhere near the actual impact that, that it had at the time? You must have been quite surprised. I uh, have a, a bit of fun story about this, and that is that I worked overnight in the studio, as we did all the Bloom and Time, with a band that I can't have no idea who they were. 
And the following day, I, I got to bed at seven in the morning or something like this. And at lunchtime, Keith Grant, who ran Olympic Studios, rang me and said, can I come in and do a session for him? And I turned him down. I said, no, I've just got out of bed. I got to bed at seven and it's now 12 or something. I can't be, you know, I, I'm just too tired, too wrecked. So um, I ignored that. But the following Thursday, I was booked to do the follow on session to that Sunday session. And the follow on session was with the symphony orchestra. Hello. And I, I had an idea, but, you know, I wasn't uh, Mr. I wasn't any uh, brilliant symphony orchestra uh, sound mixer. You know, I, but I had done it. I'd worked with other people who did it. I knew what to do. But, you know, good luck. Get on with it yourself. OK, so I overdubbed the orchestra for a track called Jesus Christ Superstar, which was Murray Head. And with, this is the track that Keith had recorded on the Sunday. And that track went on to be a hit. But it wasn't a huge hit, but John Lennon had a copy, just of interest. And John Lennon was, was tantalized by it. So nine months later, because of that, um, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice had persuaded MCA Records, clever them, uh, to go and make an album of Jesus Christ Superstar. And so when you and I, Mark, work together, you know that you send me a call sheet. Okay, and the call sheet is, what are we doing? Where are we doing it? What are we doing it with? What the criteria is, what we have to do, all the sort of parameters of it, including the local hospital. You're really clever in case somebody cuts their finger. Right. So anyway, but the call sheet for Jesus Christ Superstar was absolutely the following. It was called drums, guitar, guitar, bass, piano. And that was it. Right, oh yeah, what does that mean? That means these are the musicians. We've got five guys coming in the door. Guitar, guitar, bass, drums, piano. So the guys walked in the door and they were a band called The Grease Band who were Joe Cocker's band. And, and these guys came in the room and Henry McCulloch looked like a, a rock guitar player with long red blonde hair. And um, he was from Northern Ireland, a great fellow. And then Neil Hubbard and Alan Spenner and Bruce Rowland and a quirky, mad character called Peter Robinson. They, at that time, were the best band on the planet. It sounds really a ridiculous thing to say, but they were as good as or better than Led Zeppelin or Little Feet or mm, Vanilla Fudge. They were on the same level as that in terms of playing rock blues, rock style blues music. They had different influences. One of them had the influence from Northern Ireland and the wild stuff that he came up with. I think he was a friend of Van Morrison and then the other guy was a, a Coldstream guard. So he had the, the musicianship and the sort of drum technology that you need for that. So they were such characters and what we did was slightly good, goodness me. So, I mean, at the time there wasn't any notion of, of a super group was there but what you're actually saying to me is these session musicians had been around for a long time they were top of their tree and and they were a really good example of what I would look back now and say that was a super group well indeed I regard them as being the finest musicians of that type in the world in comparison to any other of the finest bands at that time they were very soulful in terms of their connection. They weren't guys who would equally be happy to play a bossa nova, play a, a samba or something. What they played was what they played. Their soul was in what the particular style of rock that they churned out for Andrew. And do you think that they brought something unique to the, to the actual, the way that it was recorded then? Yeah, and the rest. Those guys brought their heart and soul and their love of music, so they brought everything they could to the day and the session, and they played beautifully, and they brought with them their love of that style of music. Talk to me a little bit about what it was like to be in the room. Do you remember what the desk was? Do you remember what the mics were using? Well, I do precisely. It was a Helios desk, homemade by a man called Dick Swettenham, upstairs at Olympic. And Olympic Studios, at that time and in the year that followed, Olympic Studios was the most successful freelance studio in the world. And it had turned over £2 million. But apart from being successful in a financial sense, it was the, the place to go. The Beatles had worked there. The Rolling Stones were almost residents in the studio. 
and Hendrix had been there. We were churning out records on a daily basis that were heard around the world. And guys went to Vietnam listening to the Hendrix records that were made in Studio One. I mean, it's, it's curious, isn't it? So Olympic was a happening and extraordinary place. And I do remember the, the atmosphere, the room, the way it worked. And the curious and amusing thing really is that I had already made a, a number one American album with Eric Clapton and Stevie Winwood, which was called a Blind Faith album with Ginger Baker and Rick Gretsch. And I was proud and loved that. And it was a, a big success in America. It was number one in America. So I had some legacy walking in the door to work with Andrew and Tim. They, they knew what they wanted, but they didn't have the studio experience that I had. And I had, uh, I hoped to think that I had, you know, a, a welcoming smile and a get on with it. What are we doing? How can we do it? How can we do it the best? And my interest was simply that how can I make this, whatever we're doing today, how can I make it sound fantastic? And we worked together with the band and myself and Bruce Rowland in particular to work out how can we make this sound brilliant? And we did. So there you are. You're in Olympic Studios in London, um, which at the time was probably the leading studio. Tell me what happened next. I was phoned up by the two guys who ran MCA Records at the time when we were making Jesus Christ Superstar. Brian Brawley rang me up. He's not with us any longer. Would you like to come in for a conversation concerning working with somebody called Paul McCartney? And I said, I'd be delighted. And um, that's the next part of my life, really. A, a, a year later, whatever it was, I worked with young Paul McCartney and beautiful Linda and Denny Lane and Jimmy Cullock and um, another drummer called Joe English. Uh, that's another story. But I worked with Paul in New Orleans and then in L.A. And I made Venus and Mars album. My life as a child had been, you know, with my dad, a singer, and my mum, a piano player. Paul McCartney's dad played in a band. We both are Irish guys. We both loved singing and music. And I'm not comparing myself to Paul McCartney for, for a millisecond, but we were from the same culture, essentially. And uh, I so thoroughly loved and respect and um, had such a marvellous time working with Paul. Uh, what a gift that was to my life. In fact, that was my third number one American album. And I'm very proud to tell you. So the, the three of them are Blind Faith, Jesus Christ Superstar, and Venus and Mars with Paul. And I sang harmony with Paul on a track called Lonely Old People. And that was the highlight of my life. If you ask me to tell you something amusing about my life, I'll tell you I sang harmony with Paul. Thank you, Paul. How important do you think it is that, that there is that soulful Irish element to your story. How important do you think that is? I think it's tremendously important because first of all, I had a heritage of my dad as a singer, something near the sort of voice of Roy Orbison or maybe Ricky Nelson or later Art Garfunkel or Daniel Bedingfield, this type of high harmony singer. And Paul McCartney is the same type of wonderful, he's called an alt contra, he's a tenor. Uh, which is part of my psyche. So, first of all, I, I loved the fact that I was empathetic with Paul and he was a hero to me and I loved his stuff. Of course I did, didn't we all? And there I had the opportunity to work with him. I feel very honoured that I did. And we made a beautiful record. So, um, cheers to you, Paul. What would your definition of what music is for humanity? Music, to me, is spirituality mixed with mathematics. So it's the spiritual, soulful connection of each other, of humanity, of life, of joy. And the mathematics of it are that it's in tune. So that's maths in terms of pitching. And then it's mathematics in terms of it has bars. In other words, it has a start and a finish and it has uh, melodic content, which is f very, very important to me. It has chordal structures. But I mean, essentially, boiling all that down, it's spirituality and mathematics. And it was part of my life from the age of 17 till I was 39 and as a professional sound mixer. 
I think when I've had conversations in the past about what it is that defines why I've put so much emphasis and importance on me on, on music for me personally, it's it's the resonance, the harmony and the frequency of it all and how that reflects you as a person. If you have an appreciation of music and and the way it touches what I think is hard to define as as anything other than your soul, I think it's it's something that really is spiritual. And I think it's it's a unique thing in human beings that we have this connection with with what probably is is a universal force which is this understanding appreciation of music and also the ability to produce it from thin air how would you add to that i think you've summed it up beautifully mark i i couldn't add a word to that i uh, i just feel blessed my parents educated me in in that world and then i had the absolute blessing in a sense of walking into a studio when I was 17 to meet and work with Stevie Winwood and Ray Davis and we just carry on down the list Brian Jones and everybody else who added to my life what a way to live it wasn't a job it was a passion I saw Sammy Davis Jr. sing in Studio One at Pi Studios my goodness me I will never forget his wonder and you're just looking at a man who who had come from a difficult place and was such a wonderful, wonderful singer. That type of thing touches my heart. I don't go a lot for what you would call three-finger music made with the machine. Brilliant, but um, I love I love Black Eyed Peas. Is that the name of the band? Yeah, I love them, but and there's some fab, fab stuff going around, but I think I was just very privileged to be in the music business when it was important. I made all the Slade hit records and that, that was a connection as well. Um, I think I made six number one hit singles in England, several number one albums. I made the first Deep Purple number one album as well. How funny. Loved Ian Gillen, my goodness. Let me just ask you this. I, I can remember the time I was working on a documentary in America and I remember walking into Ardent Studios Muscle Shoals and I remember just feeling it in the walls just feeling the actual the actual essence of what had been soaked up in those soft furnished walls and thinking oh my god I'm actually in Ardent Studios and and the only other time that I can remember feeling that was I was I was recording an interview with George Martin in Abbey Road you can feel it in the walls can't you yeah oh completely I was in Cologne Cathedral just recently and I was also in Frankfurt Cathedral. You can just feel sometimes the wonder of the architecture and the music that had sailed around those walls. It's very important to human endeavours, to human culture and certainly to our spirituality. I love it and I'm not talking religious spirituality, just spirituality as interconnected people. Very important, very, very important. Thank you.